Well, good morning, everyone, and welcome to our nine o'clock worship hour. Those of you who are here in person, welcome on this beautiful Mother's Day. And to those who are joining us via live stream, thank you so very much for not only joining us, but for your positive comments and your likes and all that good stuff that lets us know that you're participating in worship with your church family. And so I'm looking forward to this time of worship. Of course, I'm joined by Brother Frank Thompson, who blesses us uh, through music. Thank you, Frank. And I would like to call your attention to the beautiful flowers back here. They are given today in celebration of all of our women, of and especially in recognizing our mothers. But thank you to those who made that possible. Also, uh, some of you have been hearing about a class that I will be offering beginning May the 19th, which is on a Wednesday at 11 a.m., entitled, Are You Smarter Than a Cop for Man? And we are going to be, it's a six-week study, so it's not a really long commitment, but I'm looking forward to teaching it because we will be taking God's Word and looking at those things that we hold dear as uh, as United Methodists. So it really is, it's, uh, are you smarter than a man? And the subtitle would be the heart of Methodism. And so I'm looking forward to sharing that time with you. Well, don't know what kind of week you've had. I'm sure it's been a full one, but... This is an opportunity where we can just exhale and breathe in the very presence of the living God as we center ourselves in this time of worship, offering up to him our very best in worship, for he's worthy of it. And so I would just invite you to join with me in this time of worship as the light of Christ enters our presence and as the music calls us to worship. Let us sing a song of praise together. Let us sing a song of praise together. Frank, 
I would invite you to join with me in our call to worship. A new day has dawned. God's gift of life is renewed in you and me. Praise God for today. Praise God for the creative spirit in our midst. Be still and know that God is here. Let the spirit in. We are ready to pray and to rejoice and to hear God's word. Then listen and respond to God, who meets us in new ways in worship, as well as in every day in the world. Come to us, O God, and guide our worship. Speak to us in the word we need, and let that word change us and empower us to be your identifiable people. Amen. Frank. Praise God. Praise God. God is worthy to be praised. invite you now to join with me as we share together in the Historic Apostles' Creed. And I know you've heard me say this many times, but if anyone should ever ask you, what do you Methodists believe in? It is a wonderful thing to be able to share these words. Join with me. I believe in God the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, 
suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, dead, and buried. The third day he rose from the dead. He ascended into heaven and sitteth at the right hand of God the Father Almighty. From thence he shall come to judge the quick and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. On this Mother's Day, we would like to recognize all the women who are present in our service. We have something for you. Shelley and Patsy put their creative juices to work and have just come up with something that you can use. But also, I want you to know, uh, we will be, our church will be giving an offering to the United Methodist Children's Home in Ruston in, the honor, in honor of the women of our church. And we just feel like that is such a wonderful, uh, generous thing to do as we honor you. So Luke, if you don't mind, would you just come and just help get those to each woman in our service. And mothers, we do recognize you, but we also want to recognize all the women who are present this morning. And once Luke has made those available, I want to lead us in a prayer. just invite you to, well, if you want to keep your eyes open, that's fine, or if you want to bow your head and close your eyes, but I would like to offer this prayer. Father, we thank you for our mothers to whom you have entrusted the care of every precious human life from its very beginning in the womb. Watch over every mother who is with child. Strengthen her faith in your care and love for her and for her unborn baby. Help us all to grow daily in knowledge and understanding of your Son, Jesus Christ, that we may share this love with all who depend upon us. Assist all spiritual mothers, those who, though they may have no children of their very own, Nevertheless, care for the children of others, of every age and stage of life. Grant that we may know, grant that they may know the joy of being created in your image and likeness. We ask your Holy Spirit to comfort all mothers who sorrow for children that have died are ill or estranged from their families, or who are in trouble or danger of any kind. Father, help grieving mothers to rely on your tender mercy and love for all your children. For many sons and daughters, this is the very first Mother's Day without his or her mother. May all who grieve this day find your peace and your promise to never leave us orphaned. For those who have felt abandoned or unwanted, please, O oh God, draw close to them with your comfort. And for the mother who this day will go hungry so her child can eat, 
for the mother who this day will neglect the needs of her child and for the mother who, who has had to make difficult decisions or who live with regrets. May your Holy Spirit constantly inspire and strengthen them to walk in the new way your salvation offers. And Father, you know the need of each woman in this place. Be exactly what she needs on this day. In Jesus' name, amen. always my prayer is that God would use me in spite of me and that my words would not be a hindrance to his word and that each one of us would be as present in this place as he is. If you have your Bibles and would like to follow along with me, I want to read from 1 John chapter 5, the first six verses. You should see the text on the screen behind me as we continue to think about reclaiming our identity. And for a few moments this morning, we want to think about our identity as a peculiar people. If you're comfortable in doing so, and if you're able, I would invite you to stand and honor the reading of God's Word. Everyone who believes that Jesus is the Christ has been born of God, and everyone who loves the parent loves the child. By this we know that we love the children of God when we love God and obey his commandments. For the love of God is this, that we obey his commandments. And his commandments are not burdensome. For whatever is born of God conquers the world, and this is the victory that conquers the world, our faith. Who is it that conquers the world but the one who believes that Jesus is the Son of God? This is the one who came by water and blood, Jesus Christ, 
not with the water only, but with the water and the blood. And the Spirit is the one that testifies, for the Spirit is truth. The Word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. You may be seated. I realize it's a rather risky thing to just put it right out there, you know, that we are a peculiar people. But the truth is, we don't need anyone to tell us that, do we? We have our own little peculiarities and so forth. That This makes us who we are and why people love us, right? That's what I tell myself. But we really do, you know, as we've sought to reclaim our identity as a people of God and as the church. I see in this text that I've just read, as in all of John, but he is describing a peculiar people. And the reason for that is we really do hold to a peculiar notion of love. That we hold to a peculiar notion of faith and obedience. And this is described for us. So I would just like to see if we can find something within God's word here that will encourage us and to challenge us to live up and live out that identity which is ours as far as a peculiar people. Now, this peculiar notion of love, he's not talking about just any love, and I'm not going to rehash what I've already shared with you multiple times, but he's not talking about, you know, some sentimental, superficial, saccharine-like kind of emotional bent or feeling, but rather... He's talking about a love that is best described in the phrase that we've already looked at regarding Jesus, who is, who epitomizes, who manifests this kind of love, that he laid down his life, which, yes, he actually physically laid down his life, but it also means, as for me, that there are no, there were no limits, there were no boundaries to how far he would go in meeting the need of another. But then John also continues to say, and so you ought to lay down your life for one another. Might that mean death? It could, for the sake of the gospel or in the time of persecution. But I think what is more challenging for us, honestly, what is more challenging for us because I'm about to be 73, and my life has never been threatened. I've never felt the, an ounce of fear for my life because I'm a preacher of the gospel. Never. But it's a whole other thing to be willing to lay my life down for another, meaning that there would be no limits, no restrictions, no boundaries to how far I would go in helping meet the need in the life of that person. That's a different story. And that's the kind of love that John is talking about. But in our text, y'all, he really does a peculiar twist. He takes a peculiar turn in the road here. And, And that is, up until now, John has been saying something like this, and we've read it. By this, we know we love God because we do what? We know we love God. By this, we know we love God because we love the other. And John really gets in their face about this. I mean, it was one of these, hey, don't, don't come talking to me, sister. Don't come talking to me, brother, about how much you love God whom you cannot see when you don't even love the person whom you can see. I don't want to hear it because I've got one, one word for you. Liar, liar, pants on fire. Well, that's more than one word, but that's what he calls them. Don't tell me you love God when you don't even love the person whom you can see. But here, y'all, he does something really interesting. He does something peculiar. He says, and we just read it, by this, we know we love one another. When we do what? When we love God. There really is a twist. I love how John R.W. Stott says it. It is as impossible to love the children of God without loving God as it is to love God without loving his children. In other words, these are two inevitable consequences of being identified as 
the people of God, as a follower of Jesus, as the church. That is, you love God, we're going to do what? We're going to love one another. And by how I love you is an is a manifestation of my love for God. You can't separate them. But John doesn't even stop there. Did you catch that? He doesn't even stop there. You know, by this, by our love for one another, we love God. But then he adds, and we keep his commandments. It's not only a matter of just loving God, but it also is a matter of keeping his commandments. Which, for me, John is telling us that this love, this peculiar love, is not an emotional, subjective experience as much as it is Something that is intentional and willful and active and practical and objective. And that's peculiar. Because I'm telling you, we love our cards that talk about love, right? And so much of that has to do with how I feel, what I feel, that feeling of this thing called love. And here John is saying, hey... This is how we love. We love God, and yes, we also keep his commandments. Now, who loved like that? Of course we know who loved like that. Jesus. And look at whom he loved. Outsiders and the marginalized and the oppressed and the needy and the disabled. He just poured his love out on folks who were rejected by so many others. And look at how he loved, graciously and generously, showing hospitality and love and and mercy, even laying down his life. And y'all, this kind of love, this peculiar kind of notion regarding love, has its practical consequences for each one of us. It really does. This kind of love liberates from our own preoccupation with our own status and forces us to get our minds off ourselves for the sake of the other, for our community, for our neighbor. This love builds community where relationships are not based on race, or political biases, or economic status, or sexual orientation, or one's educational level. It's all based on God's love for all people. Now, I know that you know this is true. And I know that you know that this is something that we like to say in church. But it is so tempting to be thinking. And if this is, if you're with me, if you are thinking this, I get it. Pastor, it sounds, it's nice on paper. And it sounds wonderful in words in this setting. But are you sure? Because I wonder, I wonder what's going off in our own heads, what we possibly could be thinking when we hear words, okay, by this we know when we love one another, we love God and keep his commandments. I wonder what goes off in our heads when we hear something like that. If we would even think, impossible. I have my doubts about this love and obey thing. Just doesn't work in my world. But did you catch what John adds about loving God and obeying his commandments? 
He said his commandments are not what? Did you catch that word? Burdensome. Now, I know we preachers have a lot to answer for. And one thing we have to answer for is we put incredible burdens on people, I think, to get them to do something. Every now and then someone will come up to me and say, well, you need, you need to get them in church. You need to call them. Get in. I said, brother, that's not my job. You call them. The burden is the call. Now, do I want folks here? Yes, but I'm not going to manipulate and gouge and guilt someone into coming to church. And on top of that, if the spirit of the loving Jesus isn't enough, then what in the heck a five foot eight inch old man's going to do? And y'all, that what he's telling us is that these commands are not burdensome. What did Jesus say about his own yoke? It is easy. What did he say about his own burdens that he place, places on someone? They're light. And on top of that, y'all, Jesus says the very same thing twice. Now, do, do you think he's mean? mean-hearted and mean-spirited when he says, if you love me, you'll keep my commandments. And then to not make that possible for us to do it, how mean would that be? But he says, John tells us, his commands are not burdensome. You know what that means? As for me, it means it's not beyond my ability to do it, to keep it, to obey those commandments, to love him and to love one another. And that's what we see here that in this peculiar text, we see this peculiar promise that he makes it possible for us to live out a peculiar promise. He tells us that, and it begins with faith, with faith. Faith is the victory. Faith, not just a mental assent, a mental assertion, in a belief system, but a faith that is a trust and confidence and assurance and conviction, not only that Jesus is who he says he is, the Son of God, a claim that is attested by his baptism and his death, that's what the water and the blood are about, but that he also, that we also have the faith, the confidence, the assurance, the conviction that what he has promised He provides, he makes it possible for us to do. To love him, to obey his commandments, and to love one another. And he even makes it possible for us to live it out in this world in which we live and face all that we face. That's what he mentions, how we've overcome This faith is the victory and that it conquers the world. It's very important that we understand what John means by the world, cosmos. He's not talking about humanity or creation or the universe. But rather he is talking about word refers to a, and I'm indebted to Walter Wink for this, a human sociological realm that exists in estrangement from God even while claiming to know God. And Wink says probably the best one word that sums up world is system. A system or the system. Whether it be socio- a socioeconomic or political, even religious. The system. Sounds like, see if this doesn't sound familiar. The system is rooted in deep-seated anxiety and scarcity and fear. The system thrives on greed and power and deceit, which produces poverty and alienation and exclusion and anti-love for the other, and usually always ends up in violence, the loss of life. And see, y'all, this, this world, this system, according to Wink, is a prevailing world atmosphere that we breathe in the toxic air. And sometimes we aren't even aware aware of how much it has taken control of our lives. 
For this system teaches us what to believe. Have you heard greed is good? It teaches us what to value. One can never have enough. Or it teaches us what to see. Meaning, the system tells our brains what is real, and that is what we must notice and accept as truth. And everything else must be ignored. For example, the big lie. And as Walter Brueggemann writes, the system will last and last and last and nothing can be done about it because it is so powerful, so dominant, so comprehensive, so smart. That is the world that John is talking about, the system. But John proclaims that the system, the world, does not have the last word. That belongs to God. Here's what he says. For whatever is born of God conquers the system, the world. And this is the victory that conquers the world, our peculiar faith. Who is it that conquers the world but the one who believes that Jesus is the Son of God? This peculiar love, obedience, and faith have conquered the system through the very life of the one who is the source of our identity, Jesus. And today, we now live and love and obey in that victory. But we must work out a continued conquest in our own lives. The world is going to be right in our face every day. But yet, here we stand as those who have overcome, who have conquered the world through our faith, our love for God and for one another. May we live this out. May this be a part of who we are because our identity is at stake, my brothers and sisters. It is at stake. Amen.
Thank you for being here this morning, and I pray that you have a wonderful week. Those of you who have joined us via live stream, thank you so very much. If you are able, I would invite you to stand for our benediction, and following the benediction, Luke is going to come and take the Christ candle out, representing our taking the Christ candle out. And now may the grace of the Lord Jesus Christ and the love of Abba Father and the sweet communion of the Holy Spirit go with each of us. And as we go from this place, may we go filled with the light and love and faith and victory that is ours, enabling us to conquer the world. In the name of the one who has conquered, Jesus the Christ. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen.